Hey there, I'm Doug Boynton. You found WHRO's Weekly Edition. Yeah, it's that time of week. We'll round up the news and stories that made waves around here. Stick around, it's going to be a ride. All right, here's what we've got this week. Norfolk's Casino, jackpot. The Planning Commission gives it the green light. We'll also dive into how women in the military are navigating the health care system post-Dobbs. Here's a hint, it's not by the book. And if you missed the Senate debate, no problem. WHRO's Michelle Hankerson has the notes for the highlights. Women should be protected to make their own reproductive decisions before the point of fetal viability. All that and more is coming up. It's WHRO's Weekly Edition. It only took six years, but Norfolk's Planning Commission finally gave the thumbs up for the city's much-talked-about casino project. But wait, there's a catch. Turns out this approval raised a few eyebrows. WHRO's Ryan Murphy has the scoop. Planning Commission Chairman Kevin Murphy questioned why the casino now wants to allow smoking inside, saying the previous development group said it would not permit smoking. Despite Murphy's objections, the commission voted 5-1 to one to back the casino's new development agreement. Next, it'll be considered by the city council, the last major hurdle before the project can proceed. Murphy voted against the approval because of the change in smoking policy. At his request, the planning commission will take up a zoning proposal at a future meeting to ban smoking in Norfolk casinos. A timeline submitted to the city says the casino will initially open in a temporary building next to Harbor Park in late 2025. Construction on the full hotel and casino complex would finish in September 2027. Ryan Murphy, WHRO News. A company by the name of Apex Clean Energy is cranking up a wind farm in North Carolina's Chowan County, down the road from Edenton. WHRO's Catherine Hafner took a trip to the site to see those big windmills in action. The Timber Mill Wind Project includes 45 turbines across more than 6,000 acres of farm and timberland. Richard Bunch drives through some muddy roads and points out a few. These were the first two that we put up, probably about 3,000 feet from my back door. Bunch is a local rep for the project who used to work in economic development. He says Chowan's the smallest county in the state, and this type of project doesn't come around every day. It's hard to attract major industry into a small rural county. So when a company comes here that's got the resource to build a $400 plus million project and pay $1.2 million a year in tax base, that's hard to say no to. The turbines should be spinning by November. The electricity they produce will all go to Google to power data centers. Katherine Hafner, WHRO News. Since the Dobbs decision turned Roe v. Wade upside down, women in the military have built a kind of underground network to fill in the gaps where military health care misses the mark. WHRO's Steve Walsh reported the story for WBUR's Here and Now. Women in the military have had a difficult time accessing abortion care for decades. The Supreme Court's decision to outlaw abortion and the often shifting state laws that followed are making abortion access much more challenging for women who are on active duty. Steve Walsh with WHRO in Norfolk, Virginia, has the story. You will grab a seat wherever, couch, wherever. Staff Sergeant Octavia James is in the Air Force Reserves. She's already helped several airmen struggling to find abortion care. And she says she would do it again. I would. And I'm going to get a little bit emotional, but I would. Because I know that if I didn't have that support, what would I do? And you don't want to turn your back on someone, especially in the military, because, you know, suicide rates are so high. Two women even stayed in her apartment in Norfolk, Virginia. She remembers helping one of them out of the shower when her sedation was slow to wear off. James and other service members describe an underground railroad of soldiers, sailors, and airmen helping one another. One airman didn't want to go to her supervisor. Her commander was someone who was very, very religious, like very religious. She's like, I can't go to my commander for this. The airman showed James one of her texts from her supervisor. I don't believe you, or you're lying, or I think you're trying to get out of work, or you're just trying to get out of this deployment that's coming up. And she's like, no, I'll do all of those things. But this is just what I need right now. When the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade in 2022, the Dobbs decision made it difficult for women stationed around the U.S. to navigate changing state laws to find care in the community. 
In addition, the Hyde Amendment, which has been in place for decades, continues to restrict spending on abortion for troops and employees of the Department of Defense. And you have a driver here on site? Okay. All right, hon. Just have a seat. They'll call you back in a few moments. Virginia Beach has become part of an informal network of military towns, seeing an uptick in military clients as state laws change. When Florida imposed a six-week ban, more women headed north. Marin Sinicola is a nurse at Planned Parenthood in Virginia. I think a lot of military folks have friends in other areas with like a high uh, military population, right? So if I'm stationed in Jacksonville, I might know someone in Virginia Beach that I can stay with. In most cases, women must find care outside the military and pay for it themselves. Military doctors will only perform abortions in cases of rape, incest, and where the life of the mother is at stake. I am not trying to make light of the very real issues that civilian women have of cost. But you do not need your boss's legal permission to travel. That is the first hurdle that active duty service women deal with. The second is you do not choose where you live. Caitlin Clausen is a former army captain. She's now at the University of Pennsylvania researching how women in the military access abortion. Many women say they have a difficult time even getting good information on their options. You know, as a healthcare provider, we can do better for these service women who have volunteered to serve our country, and we should do better. The military itself has done very little of its own research on abortion. Clausen is searching chat rooms and private Facebook groups to find her subjects. There are participants who've discussed, you know, I ended up having to disclose to my chain of command that I had a pregnancy. And I had the procedure done on Saturday. And when I came in on Monday, I was forced to take a PT test, push-ups, sit-ups, and a two-mile run. With the help of military women, NPR posted requests for interviews on some of the same sites. We offered to withhold the name of an officer who talked about her experience as a young ensign. The officer fears if her name is known, it could still affect her career. She detailed the embarrassment after her medical information was not kept confidential. In 2019, she was based in San Diego. After she complained of nausea, the medical team told her commander she was pregnant even before giving her the required blood test. Just shocked, blindsided, upset, definitely. Um, Like at the very minimum, if they had done that, I would have appreciated a heads up. She says her commanders were preparing paperwork to have her removed from the ship before she could tell them that she decided not to keep the baby. Then others on the ship found out. They don't take you as seriously or little by little undermines your ability to get the job done. Finding abortion care used to be a problem for women stationed on ships or in places around the world where abortion was illegal. Increasingly, women inside the U.S. find themselves hundreds of miles away from a private clinic. My son was six months at the time. I had also suddenly lost my mom unexpectedly right before I gave birth. So mentally, I just was not, I could not handle another kid. An Air Force sergeant had transferred from Germany to Minot Air Force Base in North Dakota just after the Dobbs decision. NPR offered to withhold her name. The remote base hosts part of the U.S. nuclear arsenal. She and her husband drove more than four hours to the only clinic in North Dakota. She says her Air Force provider seems sympathetic but hands-off. I did not get any information from him. The other resources I got was from the Red Rivers Health Clinic. Soon after her visit, the clinic shut down when the state's near-total abortion ban took effect. The hole will remain in place as long as the Pentagon's illegal abortion policy remains in place. After the Dobbs decision, Senator Tommy Tuberville of Alabama held up confirmation of all top military appointments for months. He said it was to protest a Defense Department policy that pays for travel and leave for women who may have to go out of state to seek an abortion. Only 12 women used the program in the first seven months, according to the Pentagon. Advocates say if doctors issued the leave, women wouldn't have to go through their commands. There are still deep concerns that having an abortion could follow someone throughout their career. Even taking a pregnancy test can feel like an illicit act. I was in a gas station bathroom because I didn't want to take a pregnancy test into the dorms because I was afraid, like, oh, what if someone finds this in the trash? Air Force Colonel Sharon Arana is stationed at Langley, Virginia. In 2009, she was in officer's training school in Alabama. She remembers her and her husband stopping at a gas station to take a pregnancy test. 
She now leads an Air Force group that looks at barriers women face in the Air Force, including access to abortion. A lot of the people who in the military who are getting abortions right now are those of our airmen who are still in training or living in the dorms. And so they're young, right? They don't know the policy. They haven't learned yet how to advocate for themselves. And they are kind of beholden to their leadership to take care of them. Arana has reached out to hundreds of current and former airmen. One woman sold her car to pay for an abortion. The overturning of Roe v. Wade makes the strict limits imposed by the Hyde Amendment even more unworkable, she says. Arana is now seeking solutions outside the military. She says she's working with University of Pennsylvania researchers to design a private website to help military women find good and timely information about their options. The Department of Defense responded to requests for comment by referring NPR to the list of existing Pentagon policies. For NPR News, I'm Steve Walsh. Still to come on Weekly Edition, in our Democracy in Action series, we visit a Navy veteran making Virginia tougher against climate change. And get this, there's a Hampton nonprofit turning guns into garden tools. Yeah, you heard that right. But first, Virginia U.S. Senator Tim Kaine and his Republican challenger, Hung Kao, faced off in their only debate at Norfolk State University this week. They tackled the big stuff, cost of living, military recruitment, immigration, and reproductive health care. Did you miss it? No worries. WHRO's Michelle Hankerson was there to catch the action. Kane and Cow's divide was most evident when pressed about reproductive health care. Cow, a Republican from Northern Virginia, said during the debate he was pro-family and wants to incentivize insurance companies to cover IVF treatments. But he agrees with the Supreme Court's 2022 Dobbs decision. It opened the door to outright abortion bans across the country. Cal says he wouldn't support that as a senator. Hold on. I want to be very clear tonight. I will not sign any bill at the federal level to ban abortion. I don't know where he gets this from. The Supreme Court made the right decision to push this down to the states. Senator Tim Kaine, now running for his third term, says overturning Roe v. Wade was a mistake and wants to codify a national right to abortion. Women should be protected to make their own reproductive decisions before the point of fetal viability. Kaine voiced what he called a faith-based opposition to abortion when he ran for governor in the early 2000s, but he supported access to the procedure throughout his political career. Kane said during the debate he supports states putting reasonable limitations on abortion access, like in Virginia. He said the state's law is a good model for the United States. Michelle Hankerson, WHRO News. This is WHRO's Weekly Edition. Remember, for any stories you've missed, you can visit us on the WHRO smartphone app or all social media platforms. The Virginia Center for Investigative Journalism at WHRO is spotlighting everyday folks who keep our democracy ticking. Whether it's through their job, their activism, or volunteer work, this week, WHRO's Catherine Hafner chats with Ann Phillips. She's got four decades of public service under her belt, first with the Navy. Now she makes Virginia stand strong against climate change. Uh, My name is Ann Phillips. I am 63 years young. What I've found as a public servant my entire life, really, and as as the daughter of public servants, is that people are so extremely dedicated to the work that they do. They value their contribution to society and to their broader community in whatever role they have, and they want to see success for the greater good. And I think that's what public service is all about. I'm a mid-Atlantic person, mid-Atlantic girl. Grew up in uh, Maryland, largely. My father kept moving away from Washington, D.C. until we got to water and then we stopped. The Navy always fascinated me. I did grow up in Annapolis. The Naval Academy is there, so I saw it from that perspective. I was a teenager when the Academy first opened its doors to women. So when the opportunity to join the Navy came my way, I, I wanted to try to pursue that. What I wanted to do was go to sea on ships, and that had not been open for women. And I was extremely fortunate that the timing just worked out, that as ships began to open, I was a young officer who wanted to go to sea, and the opportunity came along, and I was able to to seize it. So once I finished college and completed my ROTC program, off I went to the Navy. And I was very fortunate that surface warfare opened up to women, and I had an opportunity to serve on a, a training aircraft carrier in Pensacola, Florida, USS Lexington. 
from there on, it was really off to the races. I drove ships, I commanded ships, I commanded a squadron and commanded a strike group, ESG-2, Expeditionary Strike Group 2, here in Hampton Roads. That was my last tour on active duty. After I retired from the Navy, I was seeking what to do next and kept landing on going back to school. I attended uh, William and Mary and got an MBA after that. And really during that time, I was asked to participate in a pilot project that Old Dominion University was a part of, working with the National Security Council on the impact of rising waters, sea level rise, climate change on the Hampton Roads region in particular. I had very little, no background in that topic, but I was asked if I would lead a committee and I picked infrastructure because I had some knowledge of what happened on the base when it flooded. I spent the next two years while I was finishing my MBA working with a tremendous group of public servants uh, who came from all across the Hampton Roads region. I felt there was a lot more to be done and that this was a matter of urgent importance to this region, but really to our nation. The General Assembly created a position, the uh, special assistant to the governor of Virginia for coastal adaptation and protection. And uh, eventually I was I was offered the position. So I had the opportunity to serve in a state administration for Governor Northam for almost three years, working on an extensive collaborative effort on developing our first coastal resilience master plan. As that was coming to a close, I had an opportunity to just completely on a whim throw my name in as a in the context of would you work in the Biden administration? What are you interested in? I was amazed to be asked if I would consider you know, talking to the Department of Transportation and and talking to them about the Maritime Administration. And here I am. I started May 16th of 2022 after having been confirmed by the Senate. I want to thank President Biden and Secretary Buttigieg for nominating me to fill this role. I was incredibly fortunate to be able to take advantage of things as they came along. But I would say with that comes a lot of hard work and a lot of sacrifice and a lot of doing that at the expense of other things. And of course, that's the life of anyone in the military because you go in harm's way and you go where you're asked. I tend to think people sometimes dismiss public services. Oh, it's boring. You don't get much pay. And there are, <laughs> there are moments where perhaps you may feel that those things are apply to you. But for public service more broadly, you are part of a higher calling and a hard, part of a collective good. You're part of the execution of democracy in this country. That's the beauty of public services. There's always more that needs to be done. And you have an opportunity to influence it in a positive way. Community leaders gathered at Norfolk State University this week to discuss environmental justice with the Federal Environmental Protection Agency. WHRO's Katherine Hafner was there. Environmental justice means giving everyone equal access to clean air and water. Leslie gillespie Marthaler with the agency says that has to include helping right historical wrongs that disproportionately harmed communities of color. Not just put a Band-Aid on it, but trying to go back and really understand how do we make these communities stronger? Kim Sutterth was one of the activists at the table this week, representing Norfolk's South Side. She says it feels like leaders are finally listening. It's usually those of us who are on the end of environmental injustice having these conversations, trying to convince decision makers to participate. This was the opposite, where it was the decision makers reaching out. The group will meet again soon to discuss specific actions. Katherine Hafner, WHRO News. A local interfaith nonprofit held a No Questions Asked gun drop off in Hampton this weekend. And here's the twist they're turning those firearms into garden tools. You heard it right from barrels to shovels. WHRO's Nick McNamara has the scoop on how organizers are hoping this small act grows into a much bigger movement in Hampton Roads. You know the phrase, strike while the iron's hot? There's good wisdom in that. And you get about 10 seconds. <laughs> Reverend Michael Burnett strikes a red-hot piece of metal fresh from a mini-forge, clad in a suede leather smith's apron and a construction orange stole. 
The piece is slowly taking the shape of a garden mattock, but just an hour and a half prior. You know, that was an AR-15 barrel, and now it's on its way to being something that's going to feed somebody, and you have a part of that. Burnett is a minister in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ and one of the people behind a recent safe firearm surrender in Hampton. The surrender event and forging demonstration was sponsored by the James River Chapter of the Virginia Interfaith Center for Public Policy, a nonpartisan coalition of faith communities that advocate on a variety of issues in the Commonwealth, including preventing gun violence. Hampton Roads is no stranger to gun violence. We have some cities here that are in the list of the most violent cities in the country, and there is a reality to that. The chapter is just one participant in a growing national project called Guns to Gardens, which takes donations of unwanted firearms and transforms them into garden tools. It takes inspiration from a biblical verse in the book of Isaiah, portending that one day people would hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. The concept originated more than 10 years ago with a co-op called Raw Tools in Colorado Springs, which has since expanded to Philadelphia and a location in Asheville, North Carolina. Called Raw Tools South, it partners with the blossoming group of organizers in Hampton Roads. The organization sells tools and art pieces made from donated firearms and offers free tools to donors made from their unwanted weapons. Raw Tools also provides nonviolence training and resources through its workshops and demonstrations. As much as I love doing it, I hope we're not the only ones doing it. I hope there are so many folks participating in this movement within five years that we are just a blip on the radar. That'd be a beautiful thing. Organizers moved quickly after Hurricane Helene devastated Asheville, making it impossible for Raw Tool South to get to Hampton for the most recent event. Burnett stepped in at the Forge, trained in basic blacksmithing skills about a year ago. Aaron Aliff of Metalworks in Yorktown volunteered to help cut and disassemble donated guns. A lot of things came through at the last minute yesterday. It was just shy of miraculous, if it can be said it was shy of it. For Kate McGaw, though, it was a difficult morning. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Emotions are still about as raw as that material being uh, chopped up right now. McGaw is a Williamsburg resident and member of Moms Demand Action Virginia. She brought her late husband Carl's hunting guns to donate to the project. I thought this would be a nice way to kind of honor him turning some of his beloved guns into some artwork, garden artwork. You want to give it a go there, Kate? After seeing them dismantled, she took a turn swinging a hammer down on the barrel of a rifle donated ahead of her that Saturday. That's all right. We can fix it. Everything can be fixed. All right. Yeah, that's good. Oh, that was, that was something else. I think a bit of aggression coming out there, I think. Especially when I learned that was an AR-15 barrel, so yeah, even more aggression coming out. In addition to donors and disciples, local dignitaries, including Hampton Mayor Donnie Tuck, took swings of their own. The fact that individuals be willing to turn in weapons and to have that converted into a garden tool, I think that's tremendous. There's a lot for that particular individual. Though donations came in at a slow pace, Burnett says it's just the beginning for the project in Hampton Roads. Any guns we take off the street is better than none. And moreover, it's the presence in the community. It's letting folks know we're here. It's letting folks know that something like this can be done. And it's making that proclamation. All things can be made new. That violence isn't the final answer. Nick McNamara, WHRO News. That's a wrap for this week's WHRO Weekly Edition. Big thanks to Ryan Murphy, Catherine Hafner, Michelle Hankerson, Steve Walsh, and Nick McNamara for their help today. And a shout out, as always, to Connor Worley, who produced today's broadcast. Remember, you can catch full episodes on the Weekly Edition podcast feed. And don't forget to grab your latest news updates on the WHRO smartphone app at whro.org or on the WHRO Reports podcast feed. For all of us here at WHRO and WHRV, I'm Doug Boynton. Stay safe. Be well.